We are here for yet another in our series of Facebook Lives under the auspices of all nurses to talk about Nurses Take DC, the legislative agendas that are making their way through the House and the Senate. And you and I are on our way to DC in April to speak at the Nurses Take DC rally. So can you tell us a little bit about this movement? The Nurses Rally on April 24th and 25th is to support legislation for minimum mandated nurse patient ratios across the United States. A lot of nurses don't know there's legislation right now in the House and the Senate that we need to all alert our representatives to and ask them to support it. And what we talked about on one of our previous live broadcasts was that California is indeed the only of the 50 states that have has mandated nurse patient ratios. And now we're looking at something that's going to be comprehensive across the country for all 50 states. And you did a great job of breaking down how it's gone in California so people can find those other recordings on all nurses to listen back to hear a little bit more, actually a lot more about how it's going in California, especially your view, Beth, of how how that's all panned out since that legislation was passed. But what we know in terms of DC and this legislative agenda that's moving forward for the entire country is that we have House of Representative Bill HR 2392, right? That's that's the House. And then the Senate bill is S1063. Both of those need to get passed, of course, for the bill to go to the president for a signature to become law. That is what this Nurses Take DC rally is about. So Beth, can you break down a little bit for us now what the proposed ratios are? I have a table here that you and Mary sent to me. And for instance, in a regular unit, let's say a medical surgical unit, what kind of ratios are we talking about mandating? Well, in a med search unit, there will be uh, one nurse for every four patients. And we all know the acuity is climbing. Um, patients are in the hospital for the length of stay is very short. Patients that used to be in ICU, we all know are now on the floors, telemetry and step down. And so um, it's very intense. And every nurse listening, I'm sure, can relate to that. That's the situation. Just yesterday, I was talking to a nurse who said, um, uh, Oh, actually, no, it was on All Nurses, um, and she had written in to say that she was working, she was a charge nurse in ICU where they had three patients, and she was concerned that they would even have more. These are not the critically ill patients, and she, she just said she didn't understand how the people that make the decisions, the CEOs, how they couldn't understand that having safe staffing actually saves money in the long run in terms of patient outcome, in terms of nurse burnout, in terms of turnover, in terms of readmissions. So um, that's what this, this legislation does. It recognizes that um, nurses, the number of nurses staffing are directly related to patient outcomes and provide for patient safety. Right. And so you mentioned on regular like med surge units, we've got one to four. That would be the mandated ratio. Psychiatric well is man would be mandated as one to four. And I notice in this list that you sent to me from National Nurses United that rehab and skilled nursing are set at one to five. Is that accurate? Yes, that's in the bill. Yes, it is. That is in the bill. Okay. And for those of you wondering about ICU, for instance, it would be one to two. And that includes critical care. That also includes neonatal intensive care. And then all the other areas are all either one to two, one to one, or one to three, except for, for intermediate care nursery, which is at one to four, and a well baby nursery at one to six. So we're looking at some pretty significant changes in ratios compared to a lot of facilities, right, Beth? Correct, yes. I know we wanted to touch on, well, there's so much we could talk about, but we want to talk about the ways in which certain organizations are pushing back against this. Now, we know that the American Hospital Association, the AHA, is a pretty fierce opponent. Can, can you tell us a little bit about what the AHA has been saying about this and what they've done in to push back against what we have been pushing for? 
Yeah, I'll tell you, uh, the American Hospital Association um, understandably is opposed to this legislation. So if I owned a hospital and really didn't um, have my nurse soul or my nurse conscience, uh, perhaps I could understand that. Um, but that's why we have to speak up because we all know that our leadership, our executive, the C-suite, they're not on the floor. They really don't understand. Not until one of them or their family gets sick. So that's their position. They oppose that. Um, they want to. They want to have complete control over staffing. So right now, in a hospital, uh, any hospital can set staffing however they choose at any time they choose. There's nothing to stop them from giving an ICU nurse nothing for patients if if that's. And I trust me, it's probably happening or eight patients on mid-surge, or 12 patients, and they want it to stay that way. Well, we can assume they want it to stay that way, because when you have that many patients being cared for by one nurse, then you're getting all those meds and, and treatments done with the, the hourly rate of one nurse. However, you and I both know, like you already said, outcomes are worse, morbidity and mortality is worse, attrition rates go up, we have burnout, we have people leaving, people not stick, sticking around long enough. So the hospitals can end up losing quite a bit of money in the long run, but they're, they're being penny wise and pound foolish in my, in, in my view. Don't you agree? I love that. As my dad used to say, it's stepping over a dollar to pick up a dime. And All right. That's a good one. Just what you said, and we know that. <laughs> Every person on the front line knows that, but I think that, you know, from what we see, the hospitals are more concerned about the monthly budget. That's how it appears. I'm not a hospital executive, but I, I, that's how it seems to nurses. But I wanted to say that um, also there's some myths that need to be busted, myth, myth busters. I know that two days ago, the New Jersey... Nurses Association, which is an a offshoot of the American Nurse Association, and every state has their own, spoke, yes. spoke to, I think it was three or maybe it was 500 emergency room nurses and said, do not uh, support this bill because in California, in the emergency departments, they no longer have any support staff. They don't have monitor techs. They don't have unit clerks. They don't have unlicensed personnel. That's what they actually told them. Well, I'm here hmm. in California. That's just not true. I, I, it's a pretty strong term to say fear mongering. I don't really know what else to call it. Um, if I had been there, I would have asked them, what, can you please tell me what that's based on? I, I haven't heard of hospital that doesn't have in my hospital. You, the nurses don't even uh, mix their own respiratory treatments. They don't, mm -hmm. You know, they don't do their their EKGs. We have support staff that does that. They don't draw their own blood. We have support. I think in the ED they do, but throughout the hospital we don't. I've never drawn blood in my life. Right. Well, when you're fighting against a legislation and a movement that is against your better interest, and if you're a moneyed interest like a hospital, for instance, then creating that sort of fear, that sort of spin around a particular situation is probably to your benefit. Right. Because it can help to turn the tide in the direction that you'd like it to turn. So speaking of tides and turning tides, we talked about the American Hospital Association, the AHA, and let's turn towards the American Nurses Association, the ANA. And this is a very interesting turn of events for <laughs> no pun intended. So what can you tell us about the ANA's stance on what's happening in D.C. and this whole nurse patient ratio movement? This is really a plot twist when it comes. OK, to go for it. This is like Netflix. It really is. So the ANA, um, I'm not let's they support what's called staffing committees. Um, okay. It's their response. They oppose nurse patient ratios. Uh, they say it will take away nurse autonomy. I'm, I'm really not sure how that would be. And that they support staffing committee. A staffing committee, um, every hospital is to have a, establish a staffing committee. It has to be made up of 55% bedside nurses, and they will determine staffing. Um, isn't that what we have now? And it's not really working. So, I know that does exist in, in a lot of facilities, and people generally say it doesn't work. No, I'm, you know, if I'm a bedside nurse, I'm sitting down with who? My boss. 
Mm-hmm. So I don't, that's, and then I actually reached out to some nurses in Texas and I cannot find anybody who, where they're doing the staffing committees and um, they said, no, the budgets are preset. It's really misleading. It's not empowering um, whatsoever. So the ANA says it's a way to empower nurses. Well, I do believe that perhaps if I hadn't set foot in a hospital in many years and I was perhaps a bit ivory tower, maybe I could believe that. I I just have to speak from where I I live and where I am and where I work. In theory, perhaps, and I'm even a little, you know, uh, skeptical about that. Mm -hmm. But uh, in reality, no, it doesn't work. Nurses nurses do not have equal say. Um, Hospital executives, the budget will trump every time. So the staffing committees simply don't work and we have them. Now, here's the interesting, the real plot twist, though, is that legislation to mandate mm-hmm. staffing committees and therefore not nurse, you know, minimum ratios mm-hmm. introduced uh, in Oregon by Oregon Senator. Now, why, I wonder, I would just love to call him and I, I wonder who, what persuaded him to introduce this bill. I can only think that the AHA and the a ha- you know, had some part in writing the bill because it's exactly what they support. If you go to the a website, that's, that's what they support. Um, anyway, um, if you were a senator or representative and you read this bill and it has, it's titled the one for staffing committees, it's titled um, safe, the Safe Staffing for Nurse and Patient Safety Act of 2018. It sounds wonderful. It does it, sound very nice. It does. And they talk about empowering nurses. They're well-spoken. They say they're, they represent nurses. Um, so if I was a senator or representative, I would say, oh, yeah, I'm on board for that. You know, nurses are great and you guys are credible. And if that's what you say nurses want. But it's unfortunately, that's our own supposedly organization that's not representing nurses at the bedside. Right. That's very unfortunate. And just and just to um, give the counterweight to that safety act that you just talked about, the safe staffing, safe staffing for nurse and patient safety act for 2018, which is the one we are not supporting, which is being supported by the hospital industry. The one that we are supporting is the nurse staffing standards for hospital patient safety and quality care act of 2018. So they're both a mouthful. Um, these types of names. What's that? I was, I'm sorry to interrupt. I was going to say, how are we going to know the difference? So I had to give myself a little mind trick. I go, the one that we do want to support has the word quality in the title. And that's how I differentiate the two. Oh, okay. So we're going with quality. That's good. Quality. And um, we, we just heard on Facebook Live from Debbie Montebello from New Jersey. Hey, Debbie. And she said, it doesn't work and neither does staffing by acuity. I've been in healthcare since 1986 and never seen never seen them staff according to patient acuity. So, right. So I think Debbie was saying that these committees don't work and that staffing by acuity doesn't work. And we also heard from Jennifer from Kansas. We want to thank both of them for chiming in on Facebook Live here in the live chat. And that's right. So do you know anything or do you have an opinion, Beth, about staffing by acuity? What would you say? Well, as a, as a former nurse manager, I have a lot of experience of staffing by acuity. The acuity system's okay. out there, and there's many, and hospitals can purchase them, you know, different software. There's Epic, there's, you know, everybody has an acuity system. Um, they're, and now they're electronic, and that's fine, but um, they rely on uh, real-time documentation, w- which can be difficult mm-hmm. with the patient's condition, mm-hmm. you know, and then um, is. And it's not always possible for nurses to document exactly what's happening in the moment when the patient's acuity changes. Um, And also they are easily padded by nurses and easily disregarded by leadership. And what you end up with, whatever, you know, the storefront says, what really happens is they always follow the predetermined budgeted nursing care hours it's driven by the assigned patient care hours for each unit. Mm-hmm. 
So I distinctly remember working on a floor where they had a very rudimentary acuity system. It was like a one to four. And every nurse was Mm -hmm. required to determine if their patient was a one, two, three, or four. And there were different criteria. For example, a one was someone about to be discharged, ambulatory, and maybe a three was multiple addicts or uh, two feeding and so on. And a four was... um, very heavy care. Maybe they had a trach and I was on a tele for trach and multiple addicts and they were a fall and so on and so on. You can imagine. And they're getting blood. So mm-hmm. I had a nurse, uh, I had a patient, two patients that were definitely a four. And I went to my manager. I was concerned. I said, look, I just did my acuity. There are four and we're not supposed to have fours on our floor. Four means they go to a step down. And the response was, oh no, Beth, there's no fours on this floor that you must be mistaken. That's just hmm. one example of working with acuity systems that um, if anybody out there has worked with a really reliable and good one, um, love to hear about it. But, right. Yeah. Let us know if, if there one actually exists. So it's sort of like she was questioning your judgment saying, Beth, that actually doesn't exist. That wasn't actually there. What you're seeing is actually not real. No, she didn't want to. Yeah. She didn't want to deal with the fact that the patient was too heavy for our floor by workload. Then that right. You know, that that was the thing, because they the nurse managers have extreme pressure on them on throughput and workflow. And, you know, they have to kind of uh, go with the company line. There's a great deal of pressure on the nurse managers. You know, so tons of pressure. And, and we talked earlier about the power of the purse, that the budget is always the thing that's driving everything. And if we're working with staffing committees that have no means of changing the budget at all, they're just kind of moving, shifting things around, but they can't affect where the money is actually spent. I have another concern about staffing committees, having worked in hospitals been on numerous committees and led numerous committees and all kinds of things is that unless the person is really highly trained and focused, that's facilitating this committee, that committee mm-hmm. will crack. They'll become something else in a year or two. They'll start doing quality mm-hmm. initiatives or find some project to work on. And it will be very hard for them, you know, uh, unless I said it's very well trained and very well facilitated. So I don't really think it's mm-hmm. that well thought out. It's going to vary greatly from hospital to hospital, and it's probably going to be weak and not effective. Okay. All right. Well, moving right along, um, we have. Four. I can clarify that more if you like. <laughs> no, no, no. I think I think we've done enough for there. But I want to move on to Oregon, Ohio, Hawaii, and Washington, Washington State, not Washington D.C. So. We want to know people who are watching, want people watching this video to know that their representatives did something around the Safe Staffing for Nurse and Patient Safety Act of 2018 around staffing committees. And these are the representatives who should be contacted. In Oregon, we have Senator Jeff Merkley, right? He introduced what you characterized as the misguided Senate Bill 2446, which pushes for a staffing committee. So people in Oregon, constituents of Senator Merkley, you want to reach out and educate him that the ANA doesn't represent that, that this particular bill is not the bill that you want him to be pushing. You want him to push for the ones with nurse patient ratios. In Ohio, we have Representative David P. Joyce, who introduced HR 5052. And that is also about staffing committees, right, Beth? Correct. Right. And then in Ohio, we, right, that's that one. But in Washington State, we have Representative Susan K. Del Bean. She's co-sponsoring H.R. 5052, the staffing committee one. And also in Hawaii, Representative Tulsi Gabbard is also co-sponsoring H.R. 5052. So there's a lot of push towards these particular initiatives that we are not happy with and we don't want these staffing committee bills to go through. So would you have folks call these legislators and let them know what they think? I I do because there's a really, I feel there's a really good chance they're just not educated. They really, very possible. They have so much on their plate that they were approached by, you know, a lobbyist, a friend, uh, the senator from Oregon, you know, their buddy in the Senate or the House uh, saying, hey, it sounds really good for nurses. And, you know, we all support nurses, so support this bill. And not knowing better, they may not know that it's really just a kind of a counterattack. 
know what we really need. Right. Exactly. So calling legislators is very powerful, which we talked about in a prior Facebook Live broadcast. We also talked about writing to them and signing petitions is one thing that has some impact, but sending an actual letter in your own words has a much bigger impact. And telephone calls do have a lot of impact as well. One of the most impactful things you can do is meet with your legislators face to face. I know that's not easy for everyone. And we've talked about the fact that some people just can't afford the time, money or resources to get to DC. We will all be meeting with our legislators, or many of us will be meeting with our legislators in the House and Senate while we're there. But remember that a lot of your, well, all of your representatives and senators have offices in your home state. So you can also try to meet with them when they're not in D.C. and they're back in their home state. So, Beth, have you ever gone to an office of a U.S. senator or congressperson in California rather than meeting with them in D.C.? No, but I plan to meet with Kevin McCarthy here uh, in my town so that, you know, when he, when he's back home. How about you? Have you, Keith? Um, no, I've never met with them in their offices. I've actually met Tom Udall. He's one of our senators from New Mexico. I've met him in person at some events. So I've spoken with him about a couple issues when I run into him at different social events in town. Um but I would feel comfortable reaching out to him and also our other senator, Martin Weinreich. So I may be doing that if I can't actually pin them down and meet with them in D.C. It might be easier to do it here in Santa Fe. So I may try to do that. So I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, please. You go ahead, Beth. Be sure and tell them uh, if you call, uh, if you email, if you write and uh, tell your representative that you're a nurse that you're a constituent. And both of those things will make them really listen because we are important. They listen to constituents if we take the time to reach out to them and let them know, you know, what we need. And, you know, because you're a nurse, you're very, you're seen as very credible. Your representative would be glad to hear from you. One thing that's really important, Beth, and you have talked about this before in some of your articles, is that when you call and speak with a legislator or write to them or you meet with them in person, telling a story from your personal experience is really effective. And why, why is that so effective, Beth? Stories are always effective. You know, um, in other aspects of my life, I say the same thing. I do career counseling and I, I coach nurses on how to, you know, interview and apply for a job because stories are remembered. They're memorable. If you start, mm-hmm. thinking, you'll realize you, you listen to stories. It paints a picture and it engages the person and it's going to leave an imprint in their mind that you want to leave. So if you can tell a short story from your experience about why you support um, minimum mandated patient ratios, uh, all the better. And remember to say again that you're a nurse and you're a constituent and you would appreciate their support. Right. That's great. And the stories are important. And Beth, I know that there's some articles that will be coming out on all nurses and around Nurses Take DC. I know there are 13 states that have some sort of legislation of some kind addressing ratios, right? But most of this has to do with staffing committees, correct? Uh, Well, there are, are, the first part you said was 13 states do have some form but not of staffing. I think that, um, is it Maine? They do have minimum mandated IC ratios, but that's it. Was that the question? Right. I think it's Massachusetts has a one-to-one or one-to-two for ICU. Um, comprehensive one for all units. NICU, ED, behavioral, mid-surge, step down. It, it's everywhere. All patients. Right. right. Deserve safe staffing. Right. And then there are other states like Illinois, New Jersey, New York, Rhode Island, Vermont. They have public reporting of staffing is required so that patients can actually know what the staffing is in their hospital. So there's some stuff that's happened in different states that is okay or is a step in the right direction. California, of course, your home state is the only one that's really gone for it and really done done the whole thing. So quick question about California. I've been wanting to ask you this. When 
nurse patient ratios pass nationally? You notice I said when, not if. When it passes, will the California law then just kind of go bye bye and they'll go by the federal? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So they'll just sunset that one. Yeah. California, it was passed in 2004. And at that time, the ratio was uh, set at one to five for med surge. And I can see every day that that's, it's, how long has it been? 12 years? No. Mm -hmm. 14 years. And we all know how patient care has changed in the last 14 years. So um, our legislation really needs to be updated and be in line with the federal to tell people that all nurses.com uh they have a cartoonist artist on staff who uh created a t-shirt to commemorate the rally in washington dc in april all right i know and they're just uh really adorable in order one wear and support they're only 15 dollars, and there is no shipping oh and i want to i want to thank uh show me your stethoscope uh, again and every time, because if it wasn't for them, um, there, we would not be having this event. That's right. And Show Me Your Stethoscope is a 501c3 nonprofit. They can take donations. They can write grants. They can do all those things that a nonprofit can do. They have done amazing work. So we want to give big, big, big shout outs and kudos and props to Show Me Your Stethoscope. They are the power. They're the engine behind Nurses Take DC. I know you and I feel very privileged and honored, Beth, that we've been invited to speak on stage at the rally. And just so everyone knows, the Nurses Take DC rally is on Thursday, April 26th in DC, right outside the Capitol, just next to the Supreme Court. It's really exciting. If you can get to DC on Wednesday, the 25th, there'll be a Show Me Your Stethoscope networking event at the hotel where most people are staying in Old Alexandria, Virginia. So Beth, you and I will be there. Other people will be there as well. There'll be hundreds at the networking event, thousands at the rally on the 26th. So it's a very exciting week just before Nurses Day and Nurses Week. So the timing couldn't be better for all of us to get together. I'll be wearing my t-shirt, Beth, so we'll have to have some pictures taken. Absolutely. Photo op, yes. Yeah. Photo op, preferably with the capital in the background. I agree. Let's let's go for that. That'll be when. Okay. Okay. We'll go for the capital. So Beth, we are going to be back again on Facebook Live. They will be posted on Facebook as events. You can always go to all nurses and allnurses.com and to find out everything you need to know about what All Nurses is doing in concert with Show Me Your Stethoscope in the run up to the rally that we were just talking about on April 26th in Washington, D.C. Beth and I will be there. Mary Watts, the director of um, all nurses will be there with us. There'll be tons of amazing people. Laura, G Laura Gasparis Bonifurlio will be one of the main speakers. There's going to be some incredible people, nurse thought leaders and personalities there. You don't want to miss it if you can manage not to. So, Beth, thanks for being here with me again under the auspices of All Nurses. It's always great to see you. And, Beth, where can people find you? Uh, my, my website is nursecode.com. You can also find me on All Nurses, uh, Ask Nurse Beth. Right. And I'm Keith Carlson, Nurse Keith. You can find me at nursekeith.com and Nurse Keith Coaching on Facebook and all over the web and social media. So thank you, my friend, Beth. It's been wonderful. 